As we take a look at this text this morning, I realize that we're going to have the same challenge that we had last week. Last week I talked about husbands and wives, those of you who were here last week. Thanks for coming back. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. This past week I had one husband who said to me, I was getting nervous for my wife because you kept going on and on about husbands, but I wasn't sure if you were going to get to the wives. And Actually, it was the other way. I'm sorry. He was saying, you were saying all this about wives. I was wondering if you were going to get to the husbands. Sorry. It helps when I get the anecdote right, isn't it? That that just helps. Public speaking 101. I didn't take that class, actually, so. Um, Today, we're going to be facing the same possible temptation, if I can put it with. If I can put it that way, and the temptation would be, oh, the Apostle Paul here, he's talking to children, and he's talking to parents, or he's talking to fathers. That means the rest of us can check out, right? And the answer is, wrong. No. As we talked about last week, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, reproof, and training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So, The word that I'm going to share with you today, I really believe, is for all of us. It's for all of us. And I believe, number one, like I said in my prayer, I really long for each of us today to be Christ. It isn't so much about children. It isn't so much about fathers. This is about seeing Christ. It's about beholding the gospel of Christ, even in these two short verses. Okay? So as we dig into this text, I want to encourage you, don't tune out. I also want to encourage you, if you're a child, and what I consider a child, I I know that it might sound demeaning to some of you that are in junior high or senior high, but I'm going to call you, if you are are living in your parents' household, if you're 18 or younger, then you are considered a child in in my sight today, okay? So how many of you are there here? Would you just raise your hands? Okay, we don't have a ton, but we have some. I almost thought about talking to Alexa and saying, should we leave the children in um, during this portion? But that's okay. They're getting great stuff out there as well. But So first of all, I'm going to be talking to the children. But before we get into the text, we have to again take note of the context of this passage. As we study scripture, as we study... Um, Bible study 101 says we have to take note of the context. So I realized that I mentioned this last week, but I'm going to mention it again, okay? So, first of all, what the Apostle Paul has been doing in the book of Colossians is he's been explaining the gospel. He's been giving us indicatives, these truth statements about the gospel. These things are true. These things are true about Christ. These things are true about God. These things are true about you now because you are in Christ. So that's what he's been doing roughly the first half of this book, the first two chapters. Now we're in chapter 3, and he's giving some really practical, how do we live this out? Because of these gospel truths, now these are the imperatives. These are the commands. This is how we show that we treasure Christ. Did you know that? When we read the imperatives of Scripture, when we read the commands of Scripture, it should be about this is how we treasure Christ. This is how we show that we love him. You remember where Christ said, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me? First comes the love. And that first, the love comes from God. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. So we show our love for God through our obedience. Okay? This is the context of this text. Because of these gospel truths, because of these indicatives, these true statements about the gospel, now this is how we are to live. Like I said last week, we talked about husbands and wives. We survived that. And so, did you, was that, did you hear that? That was kind of a joke, but okay. (laughs) We survived talking about husbands and wives. And this week, Paul is continuing to speak of the authority structure that's set up by our Father in heaven. 
That's what he's doing. He's, he's saying this is the authority structure that God has set up. And this is submission to proper authority. And as I already said, he's speaking directly to children and fathers. The summary statement in your notes is this. Children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not provoke your children. And that should be the first thing in your notes. So first, children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. And I have to just say, for those of you that raised your hand a little bit ago, isn't it cool to see how Scripture addresses you directly to? Um, raise your hands again if you're in that category. Just raise them again. Okay, real quick. Um, isn't that cool that Scripture addresses you as well, directly? Not just indirectly, but very directly. The Apostle Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was giving thought to you. Sometimes you might come on a Sunday morning and you might think, well, this service is for everybody else, but not for me. But today, today is for you. I loved it when I was a kid. I remember and my pastor would start talking about sports or, or something like that, or he'd start talking about our high school or something would just perk up my ears. And I, he's talking to me. He's not just talking over my head. He's not, he's not trying to exclude me. He's talking to me as well. So verse 20 says this, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Paul's words to children here reflect the fifth commandment. Did you know that? The fifth commandment is honor father and mother in the Lord. Honor your father and mother in the Lord. That's just the first part of it. But it says, children, honor your father and your mother. This is similar to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, that says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Did you know that the law of Moses, this is a question for all of us, did you know that the law of Moses prescribed death for the child who struck or cursed a parent? Yikes! How many of you are glad you didn't live in the Old Testament times? Not that I would ever be tempted to strike my parent, and I don't know that I'd be tempted to curse them either, but wow, if that happens. Exodus chapter 21, verse 15 and 17 says this, Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Paul in the New Testament, lists such disobedience to parents as one of many grave sins. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32 tells us this. Listen and maybe read along on the screen. This is the Apostle Paul talking, and he says this, And since they did not, he's talking about unbelievers here, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. I just wanted to emphasize that there. Because you probably were getting put to sleep a little bit with that list. But all of a sudden here, disobedient to parents? What? Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Did you see that? This is an amazing list of heinous sins in God's sight. And among them is disobedience to parents. Students, how many of you knew that before? If we practice these things, students, if we practice these things, we deserve to die, the Apostle Paul says. I'm not sure how to say that gently. 
I don't think there's a gentle way to say it. There's a similar list in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. I never considered that before. It's kind of frightening to think about, isn't it? God takes this, God takes the sin of disobedience to parents very seriously. That's the next thing in your notes. God takes this very seriously. It's interesting, though, students, isn't it? Children, I, I, children just sounds not quite right. I'm going to call you students, okay? Is that okay? It's interesting to take note that some of the most popular Disney movies, if you think about some of the Disney movies you've seen, how many of them don't the main character disobey their parents? The Little Mermaid. Moana. Brave. How many of you have seen these shows? Not to mention the sitcoms that are common today, that are popular today. How many of them show obedience and submission to parents being a really cool thing? Not very many, right? Zero, most likely. So we realize, yeah, it's, it's considered cool to disobey. It, it's, con- it's considered cool to go against your parents' wishes. I mean, they are the most uncool people in the world, right? Your parents? Um, but boy, aren't the days of Leave it to Beaver gone? How many of you remember Leave it to Beaver? I mean, those were good days, right? Where, where Wally and Beaver, you know, they submitted to their parents for the most part. This command, this command to obey parents is definitely counter-cultural. Back to Colossians 3, verse 20. There are a few things I want you to notice this morning. First of all, it says, obey your parents. Paul is commanding obedience to both parents, the father and the mother. And this obedience, of course, is assuming that the parents have the best interests of their children at heart and would not demand anything improper. Students, it's hard to determine at times. There may be times, there may, hypothetically speaking, there may be times parents are wanting you to do something that's sinful. Therefore, you do not need to obey your parents. You can tell them I said so, because that's what Scripture says. You do not need to obey your parents if it's counter to your scripture. Now, you better be careful to see that in black and white. No, my, my parents told me to go steal something. No, you, you don't go steal something. You don't lie. You don't cheat. All these kinds of things, right? I also want you to take notice. It says, this pleases the Lord. This pleases the Lord. Children. Oops, I said I wasn't going to call you children. Students, when you carry out the trash, when you clean your room, yes, amen. Can I get a witness? No, just kidding. (laughs) When you do the dishes, yeah, parents, yeah, we're right there with it, right? When you do your homework willingly, When you brush your teeth before bed, when your parents tell you to, do you know this? This is actually pleasing to the Lord. How many of us think about that? Oh, mom, I got to brush my teeth again. Yeah, you brushed them last week. It's high time. You did it again this week, right? Or I got to take a shower again. Yeah, it's it's time, your monthly shower. Um, When you obey your parents, you are pleasing the Lord. But how many of us really think about that? Paul is not speaking here in this text of works righteousness. And what I mean by that is he's not saying that you earn God's favor or put God in your debt by by obeying your parents. Did you hear that? You will not put God in your debt ever. Okay? Paul is talking about here. In fact, none of us will ever put God in our debt through our obedience. Our obedience flows out of our love for him. It shows that we actually love him. Okay? 
It's not the other way around. We obey so that we are loved by God. No, no, no. That is not the gospel. The gospel is you are loved by God, therefore you obey. <clears throat> Paul is saying that the obedience of children to their parents is evidence that they know God and it is pleasing to the Lord. Students that are here with us, do you realize that you have a unique opportunity that your parents do not have? Are already in their own household. We talked about them last week. This is an opportunity for you that they do not have. And it's only here for a short amount of 18 years or so. You can please the Lord in a way that your parents can't. And my encouragement to you students today is don't waste it. Don't waste it. I want you to notice one more thing in this text. Paul says children should obey their parents in everything. Did you hear that? Obey your parents in everything. That leads me to ask this question. Is that even possible? Students, is that even possible to obey your parents in everything? This morning while I was thinking about this concept while I was combing my hair, I, <laughs> this occurred to me, and it didn't take very long. But this occurred to me that the implication in this text, actually it occurred to me last night, I'm just joking with you. The implication in this text is this. This is not possible. Students, it is not possible to obey your parents in everything. It's not. It isn't. Children, sons, daughters will eventually fail. They will. They will not be perfect. They cannot be perfect. The first thing that this realization should do is to point us to perfection. Who is perfection, you might ask? And I'll gladly and wholeheartedly tell you it's Jesus Christ. This text shows us Christ. Do you know that? Students, you cannot obey your parents in everything. It's meant for us to say, who was perfect? It was Christ. This points us to the perfection or the perfect obedience of Christ. Did you know that Jesus always submitted to his earthly parents? Do you realize that he, in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, submitted to his parents? It makes a specific point of Luke tells us that. Point well taken. And not only that, Christ also always submitted to his Father's will. John 4, verse 34, he says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That was Jesus' food. To do his Father's will. Jesus always did what the Father commanded him. And this is where all of our ears should be perking up again. If I lost you in talking to the students. Philippians 3 tells us that Christ was obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. He obeyed. Who was he obeying? He was obeying his Father. Jesus obeyed perfectly because he knew we would fail. That's the good news of the gospel. Do you know it? Have you heard it? Have you responded to it? Children, this... I'm sorry. Students, this... In Colossians 3 verse 20 is meant to point you to Christ. As you see, as you marvel at, as you wonder at how amazing Christ is, you are changed into his image. You become more like Christ. And then as you, are, as you become more like Christ, you are enabled to obey from the inside. It's the only way obedience truly works. Because we love him. Because he loved us first. And that enables us to obey. Not perfectly, albeit. Not perfectly, students. But more and more. 
That's going to be your desire, is you're transformed in the image of Christ. Your desire will be to obey your parents. If I can just speak a little more, students, relatively pretty candidly, maybe I already have been, a few more candid comments that I want to make about this text. Some of you students that are here with us today have a hard time obeying or even wanting to obey your parents because you have not trusted Christ for salvation. Do you realize that? Some of you have not trusted Christ for salvation. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is not living in you to empower you to obey your parents. Now, you might say, Pastor Mark, you're being a little bit harsh. Well, I'm not trying to be. I'm just trying to say what Scripture says. My encouragement for you today is this. Believe in what Christ did for you on the cross. Believe in what he did for you. Trust Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4 says this, Christ died for your sins, for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So students, if you never trusted Christ, my first advice to you is, confess your sin. Confess your sin of disobedience to you. Confess it. What you do when you confess it is you call it sin. Yep, that's sin. Okay. I'm agreeing with you, God. But you don't just stop there. You repent, that which means you turn around. You turn away from sin. And you ask God for forgiveness. And you trust him for salvation. Students, trust that Christ died to absorb the wrath that you deserve for that sin. Trust him. Trust him today. Don't wait. Christ died so that you can be forgiven and brought back in a right relationship with the Father, with God. Do you want that? Trust him today. There might be another category of students here today that have a hard time obeying because as the Apostle Paul says, though you are believers in Christ, though you are already trusting Christ for salvation, your flesh, hear this now students, your flesh is still waging war against the Spirit. Did you know that in Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul talks about this? And it seems like, doesn't it, oftentimes the flesh is winning. Did you realize there's a war going on? Oftentimes it seems like the flesh is winning, and it's going to be hard to obey your parents when your flesh is winning. So my encouragement for you today is to confess your sin. Ask for the Lord's forgiveness Run to the cross. Ask for the Holy Spirit to empower and give you strength for you to obey. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, it's your turn. You knew it was coming, right? And I asked the same thing that I asked you last week, men. Are you ready? Are you <laughs> I don't know who made that noise, but it was perfect. Are you ready for this? I'm not trying to pile it on, fathers. Just so you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to pick on you, but when it comes up in Scripture, we got to talk about it, right? Right? So verse 21, Colossians chapter 3, would you look at it with me? Wives, Again, this isn't directly to you, but I encourage you to pay attention as we work our way through this text. And maybe you can help your husbands later when they go home. Right? <laughs> My wife is great at that. I don't know about you. But <laughs> and I mean that in a very respectful way. Um, I do, honestly. Right? <laughs> oh, shucks, I'm going to be sleeping on the couch. <laughs> Uh, verse 21 says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Fathers, do not provoke your children. And that begs this question, what in the world does it mean to provoke our children? What does it mean to provoke them? The explanation of this text is this, Men are urged to restrain their anger and any other attitudes that can embitter their children, lest they get to the point of despair and pleasing 
their parents. Provoking can mean coercive dominance. This is in your notes. It can mean coercive dominance on the one hand, or a complete lack of discipline on the other hand. Either one can destroy children. Did you hear that, gentlemen? Either one can destroy our children. Coercive dominance on the one hand, or lack of discipline on the other. Children can become discouraged by being unnecessarily provoked, nagged excessively, disciplined harshly, belittled, or by being ignored and neglected. This could be said to fathers and mothers, but fathers are addressed, and therefore, men, we need to take the lead on this. And fathers, of course, what our desire is right for our children is that we inspire them in Christian values and in the faith. That's what our desire is, and that's what we should be doing. But I don't want you to forget the context of this text. These commands, these imperatives that Paul was giving are in light of the indicatives, the true statements of the gospel, and that's going to come more into play as we talk about it. For some help in understanding what it means to provoke our children, would you turn over to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4? In fact, you don't need to turn there. It should be there on the screen. Ephesians 6, verse 4 says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So you see here the, the phrase, do not provoke, is in both texts. Do you see that? Some of you fathers here today might struggle with this because that's what you grew up with. I'm not going to raise your hands, but I would be so curious to see how many of us would raise our hands if I said, how many of you, that was the environment that you grew up in. Being belittled, being excessively, harshly disciplined, being nagged, Constant negativity. Where it seemed like you could do nothing right to please your fathers. Maybe your fathers were particularly, maybe, maybe fathers particularly were extremely hard to please. Or maybe they were just plain absent. At some point though, men, at some point we can't blame it on our past. We have to take responsibility We have to take responsibility for our own actions. How many of us would like to just say, yeah, I was raised that way. That's the way I'm raising my kids too. When we stand before God, one day it's not going to fly with him. We've got to take responsibility for our own actions. At this point in my message, I have to admit that I have struggled. I have struggled with this. I have struggled with the critical spirit of my wife, of my girls. I believe, I believe that ultimately this came from the effects of the law in my life. What I mean by that is not having a right understanding of the gospel. Believing that I needed to obey or earn God's favor. Let me explain a little bit further. You've heard me say, many of you have heard me say before that when I grew up, I believed that if I didn't drink, smoke, chew, or go with the girls who do, that I was going to be good with God, right? That's, that's what I believed growing up. The problem was, I was really good at that. There were no girls interested in me, so that wasn't a problem. Um, I did a good job of this. I, I, I followed the rules. I was a rule keeper. I thought I did a pretty good job of this. And that led to a ton of self-righteousness. Led to a a ton of pride. It led to a critical spirit. I thought I was a little bit better than everyone else. Because they're not keeping the law as well as I am. 
Do you see how you can go there in your mind if you don't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, that all the ground is level at the foot of the cross, that we are all sinners in need of God's grace? If you think it's by obeying the law that you get into God's power, it either leads to self-righteousness and pride because you're doing a great job of it, or it leads to despair. And I was the first one. I was proud. For years, for years, I especially allowed this critical attitude to affect my relationship with Beth and my daughters. Believe me, it was ugly. I felt that they should be perfect or close to it because I was. Now, I'm kind of joking, but I'm not really. That's really what I thought. Right, Beth? Right, Monica? Monica? They'll tell you. It was about four to five years ago that I began to really understand the truth of the gospel. Let me say this loud and clear, and I want everyone here to, see, to hear it. Children, wives, men, women, boys, girls. Tim Keller says this, here is the gospel. I was more sinful and more flawed in myself than I could even imagine. More sinful, more flawed in myself than I could even imagine. But more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than I ever dared hope. Did you hear that? That is the gospel. That's the good news. Not because of anything in me or anything in us, but because of Christ. So what did I do when I started to realize that? I realized I needed to to repent for years of critical attitude. Hyper criticism. I had to repent of these things. I had to repent of self-righteousness, and I began to change because of the Lord's grace. Now, if you ask my daughters, if you ask my wife, is he perfect at this? They'll tell you no, and I'll tell you no as well. I still struggle. I still struggle with this. Even though that fleshly nature has died, it's been crucified with Christ, it still wants to rear its ugly head. And that's oftentimes how it does it. I'm still feeling, I'm still finding myself needing to say I'm sorry to our girls because I've been hypercritical or harsh with them. But now I see it and repent of it more quickly for, for the most part. And I'm thankful for the wife that God has given me to be patient with me and to help me to see these things in my life that I don't want to see. But I need to. Fathers, as we think about Paul's exhortation here, we really have to know ourselves, don't we? We really have to do some inventory. We really have to be honest. We have to think through the question, why is it that we tend to either be, and I'm talking to us as fathers again, why is it that we tend oftentimes to either be hypercritical and excessively harsh, or we ignore and we neglect? Why is that? We have to know ourselves, but we also have to know our kids. Fathers, can you hear me now? Hear me now. Fathers, we have to spend time with our kids. We have to engage with them. We have to play with them. We have to talk to them. Our role, fathers, is to model, to be involved with our kids, to patiently instruct, to teach, to pray with them, to help them understand scripture, to firmly guide, to encourage, to nurture, to discipline, and to bless them by assuring them of our unconditional love for them. Fathers, did you hear me? And some of you might be sitting here today saying, it's too late. My kids are all grown up. They're out of the house. They're long gone. It is not too late, fathers. It's not too late. If this has been you that's been hypercritical, that's been negative all the time, you, your, your children just couldn't please you, pick up the phone. Give them a call. Ask for their forgiveness. Deal with the Lord first. Deal with the Lord first. But then deal with your children. It's not too late. If you're here, if they're still here, it is not too late. 
Do you realize how assuring our children of our unconditional love for them blesses them? Do you realize, do you realize that when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, that God's voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son, with him I am well pleased. Now, I don't want to go too far with that, with this, because it seems kind of psychological and pop psychology and that kind of thing. But you know what, fathers? There is power. There is power in how you demonstrate love to you, in guaranteeing your love for them. That it's not based on their performance. It's not based on how well they do on the basketball court. How well they do on the field. How well they do in their jobs. How well they do in raising their own kids. Ultimately, fathers, our goal is to point our children to Christ. Yes, we have made mistakes, right men? We have not done this perfectly. We have been guilty of provoking our children. If we've been a parent for longer than two days, it's probably true of us. Ultimately, our goal is to point our children to Christ. We are not going to be perfect, but there was one who was perfect in our place to help our children understand and trust the gospel so they will love Christ with their lives. How often don't we forget this? Another helpful text is we consider what Ephesians 6 verse 4 says about bringing up our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord is this. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 7 through 11. This will be up on the screen there for you. It says this, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they, our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good. Then we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, right? Yep. Did you ever get a switch? That discipline is painful. Not really that pleasant, right? But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This text, this text, men, fathers, this text shows us that God is the ultimate good father. You see it? He's the ultimate good father. He has demonstrated to us what it looks like to be good. This text also helps us to see that the goal of our discipline as fathers is this. It's a harvest of righteousness. It's a harvest of righteousness in the lives of our children. Is that not what we want to see, fathers, mothers? Isn't that what we want to see in our children's lives, this harvest of righteousness? Fathers, our window is short. We got one shot at this. I'm realizing this more and more the older our daughters get. The truth is, fathers, again, and I've already alluded to this, I've already spoken about this, we have to admit that none of us will get this perfectly right all of the time. As I mentioned to the children earlier, some of you fathers struggle with this because you are not trusting Christ as your Savior. You cannot give something that you yourself do not possess. Did you know that? You do not have the Holy Spirit living in you, so you cannot parent your children in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. That's just plain and simple. And again, I'm not trying to be harsh. Some of you might be thinking, wow, he's really laying it on thick today. Uh, That's not my intention. It's not really my point. But we've got to go where Scripture goes. We've got to say what the Lord is saying And I believe that he is saying this. My encouragement, if you've not trusted Christ, fathers, is this. Do it today. Do it today. Trust him. The Holy Spirit will come into your life, will enable you, will empower you to be this kind of father. Not perfectly, but he will strengthen us for 
the task. Repent. Repent of your sins. Believe on him in faith. Some of you fathers, this is another category, some of you struggle as I do because you've been duped one way or another into believing that it's truly best for us to be that kind of domineering, harsh, critical, or even absent and neglectful father. At some point, at some point, I was excusing myself. At some point, I was believing that the lie that this was better for our girls and my wife. What a lie from the pit of hell, right? My encouragement to you fathers, if you're a fellow struggler like me, is to repent. Confess that sin. Confess the sin of provoking our children anger. Run to the cross. Ask the Holy Spirit to empower us to be the fathers who love and discipline, but do not provoke our children. Here's my closing question. Children, are you obeying your parents in everything? Students, are you obeying your parents in everything because you know that in doing so you are pleasing the Lord? Fathers, are you provoking your children to the point of discouragement? Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, this is a heavy... It's a heavy text. It's a short text, but it's heavy. Dear Lord, we can't can't bear it. Not in our own strength. Neither the students, the children here, or the fathers. None of us can. So dear Lord, we cry out to you now and we repent of our sin. I repent of my sin of harshness of being hypercritical toward my girls. And dear Lord, I ask for your forgiveness. And I thank you that your word tells us that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And dear Father, I praise you that as I behold you, Father, as I see that you are the good Father, as I see that Christ always obeyed his Father's will, Dear Father, I behold Christ. As I behold Christ, I'm changed into his image. That's true for all of us here. And Lord, as we are changed, we're empowered to do what you've called us to do. I'll be it imperfectly. So Father, I pray for the children. I pray for the students. Lord, I pray that each student in the sound of my voice is trusting you today for salvation. Dear Father, that they would be led by the Holy Spirit. That they would have new life in Christ. And dear Father, that you would empower them to obey. And then, Father, I pray for the fathers here who maybe haven't trusted you in their lives. They haven't placed their faith in Christ. They haven't trusted the blood that was shed for them. Dear Father, we praise you that you give us the opportunity to turn in repentance and faith to trust you. So Lord, I pray that that would happen today. And dear Father, for those who are in my saint category, I've trusted you for salvation. I'm trusting you today. But Lord, I, I've sinned and I've struggled with this area. Dear Father, again, we confess that to you. We repent of it. We run to the cross. And Lord, we pray for your power, that we would love our wives, that we would love our children, that we would train them up to love Christ, that we would train them up to know the gospel. Dear Lord, I pray for any father here today that's maybe facing a difficult decision, maybe thinking, I, I, I do, I need, to, I need to make some things right. Dear Father, I pray that that would take place today that there would be great joy. Lord, as relationships are reconciled. Lord, what a powerful thing that would be. But Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to do that. So Lord, would you go with us as we continue to 
try to keep our eyes fixed on Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things.